Three months ago, as you know, I, you, you know we have uh, over 800, closer, getting close to a million people on my mailing list that we send out our messages to. Three months ago, <clears throat> I sent out a notice warning, prophesying, and I quote, I tell you, and this was written three months ago, <clears throat> and it was dictated on the 15th, three months to the very date of bombing of Iraq, and the next day, the impeachment process. I tell you with a broken heart, the next three months are going to be ominous and shattering here in America. Go on to tell of the full-blown depression that we believe is coming. And, you know, let me tell you from my heart, Brother Carter, my associate, handled very well this morning spoke very clearly about trampling of the truth on the streets, the loss of, uh, we're, we're, we're redefining truth, trying to lower truth completely. Do you know if, if the President of the United States is impeached, if it goes on to uh, the Senate and passes, I'm telling you now it won't be because of Monica, not at all. The shame that comes upon a nation and upon its leaders has to do with the bloodshed of the innocent. Period. The bloodshed of the innocent. Now, the Lord has made it so clear in His Word. He, he, he made it so clear that no one mistake that the difference between what we call, what is called a fetus and a live being in the womb. Because President Clinton vetoed a bill that would have stopped abortions in the third trimester. Just as John the Baptist in the womb of Elizabeth, his mother, is about to enter the third trimester six months with child, Mary walks in to Elizabeth's home. And what does the Bible say that the baby did? leaped at the sound of her voice. The, the little child heard the voice and leaped in the womb. God was saying once and for all, you will never have that excuse on the judgment day. He nailed it down. And folks, you, you watch what happens. I, I wrote it in my latest book, America on Trial, America's Last Call, that it would be because of the bloodshed Innocent bloodshed. Uh, 5,000 babies a day. 5,000 babies a day. That was told to us in a recent luncheon here two weeks ago with uh, Dan Quayle, who's going to be running for vice president, when a group of ministers met with us to have lunch with the gentleman. And he said to the pastors, do you know that 5,000 babies a day now are being aborted? That is a river of blood. Folks, no wonder the whole world it looks on us with shame. The whole world looks upon us as shame. Is a nation out of control, a government out of control. Thank God there's one solid place, and that's the rock Christ Jesus. Unshakable when everything around us is being shaken. I want you to go to Matthew, the um, second chapter. I won't be preaching long. Just, I just want to share a few things that are on my heart here. We have seen his star. I, I'm going to show you how you can say that with a wise man. You have seen his star. Oh, yes, you have. Second chapter of Matthew. Let's start. I, I want to read the first ten verses. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king... Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. By the way, I don't know where we get the idea of three wise men. There's nothing in the Bible about three. I said, well, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Well, it could have been five wise men bring gold, five bring frankincense, and five bring myrrh. There's nothing there about three wise men. Saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east. We've come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. 
When he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. They said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophets, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may also worship him. When they heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Heavenly Father, I pray that you give us insight tonight. This is not just a Bible story. This is not just to elaborate some beautiful Christmas story. There, this story is pregnant with truth. This story has so many lessons for us. God, speak to us now by the power of the Holy Ghost. Let my words find its mark in many hearts. Some that have walked in here tonight wanting you, desiring you, trying to get to Jesus, but don't know how. Oh, God, let the star, let the star lead them. Let them follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and open their hearts tonight in Jesus' name, I pray. Let this be the night they kneel beside you and come into your presence and get to know you and see you face to face. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. This story has intrigued me for a long time because uh, these are pagans. These are not religious men. And they're in what is called the East. Now, the East always represents farness. In other words, we call it the Far East, don't we? The Far East. It's the furthest point. Now, this is probably months before Christ is born. Now, now stop and think about this for a minute. What interest would uh, pagan wise men, astrologers, evidently, who study the stars, pagans, who have no moving of the Holy Spirit. They don't have a gospel. The gospel hadn't even been introduced yet. What interest would they have in a Jewish king, a Jewish baby? And what would draw them? <clears throat> now, this is very intriguing to me because uh, they have no way of knowing. Now, there were trade routes, and the only thing that I can conceive is that in one of these trade routes that went all the way from India into China and, and uh, all the way to Egypt, that the law was taken, the Pentateuch. The, the, these wise men had to have studied the Pentateuch. They had to have studied, especially in the book of Exodus. In other words, if they saw a star, how would they know what it represents? How would they know that that's the star of a king in Israel, a baby? They're not that wise. <laughs> the wisdom of the world could never comprehend that. So the only thing I can conceive is that the 24th chapter of Numbers... I want to begin reading at 15th verse. Now, look at me for just a moment before we begin. This is the only way I conceive, and I believe the Holy Spirit laid this on my heart, that, that these wise men could have ever set out on a long, tedious journey. It had to be a life and death journey. It can't be out of intrigue. It can't be out of curiosity. Not at all. This is an expensive expedition. And t I'm going to show you that it's a life and death exp expedition. It's not just a matter of going to see a child. This was life and death because they saw something here. And I want you to look at verse 15 right down through verse uh, 23. And he, t this is Balaam speaking against Israel. He took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, has said... And the man whose eyes are open has said. Now, these wise men are reading this. And this man is saying his eyes are open. And he's saying, which have heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. Now, they've just been reading that this man can prophesy. This man can see things. This man prophesies 
and he's got his eyes open, verse 17, I've seen him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter or a power shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Seth. Edom shall be a possession, Seir also shall be in possession for his enemies, and Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion, and shall destroy him that remaineth in the city. Can you imagine these men sitting around saying, listen, here is a prophetic word from a great prophet, a seer. Here's a man who, who gets in trances like we do here in our pagan nation. They believed in trances. This man has a word. There's going to be a star rise out of Israel. And this young child, this kingdom, this scepter, this kingdom is going to have dominion. And if you'll read on with me in verse 23, and he took up his parable and said, Alas, who shall live when God doeth this? Who's going to live? Folks, this became a life and death expedition. There's going to be a power rise that has, there's going to be a king that has life and death in his hands. Who's going to be able to stand? This is exactly what I said. Who shall stand in that day? Who's going to be able to stand? The, these, these men see a star. Now, folks, this is just my opinion. I have nothing, no way to prove it. But I don't think anybody saw that star but these men. Because when they do get to Jerusalem, nobody sees the star. No one else sees it. The, the shepherds didn't see it. The shepherds were called by an angel. It's amazing the many ways the Holy Ghost calls people to Jesus. Oh, how he interrupts the lives of people. We had a man walk in off the streets. He was about to commit suicide, walking down the street and say, God, I have to have a sign. You have got to show me a sign that you care for me. And he looks up and he sees a sign, Times Square Church. And God said, that's your sign. He walks in here, gets saved. He's been coming to church ever since. So... Light comes from heaven. Nobody saw it but him. But it smites him. Blind. God has his ways of a Holy Ghost to interrupt the lives of people and bring them to Jesus. But most come by the way of a star. Now, I'm going to show that to you tonight the best I can. This is my opinion. That Now, see, this is a star. These were stargazers. They knew that something had appeared. There was a star appeared that didn't have an orbit. It was not in the orbit. This was a strange star they saw. And someone said, what about numbers? 24, 17, a star shall arise. Folks, the Holy Ghost put that star there. That was the spirit of the living God. That was a work, a divine work, because that star had a drawing power. Why else would these men pick up and go for miles and miles and travel for weeks and weeks, night and day, in the burning hot sun through the desert to find a baby child who would be a king. They start out with great anticipation. This is a, this is a delegation with a lot of protocol. And, and I don't, I don't know what they intended to do. I'm sure they, they imagined that he would be born in the great city of Jerusalem that everybody knew of. And if he's a king, he's going to be born in a very palatial residence. So naturally, now, now folks, I want to tell you something. I'm going to give you a spiritual truth right now. You can't get to Bethlehem. You can't get to Jesus till you go through Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a religious system. There are a lot of people trying to get to Jesus and they get as far as Jerusalem and they get into a priesthood, they get into a religion and they, 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 that, that'll never get you to Jesus. That'll get you to religion and no further. The star led them to Jerusalem, but Bethlehem was six miles on. They get to Jerusalem, the star is leading them. And this star has its own orbit. That star is in the orbit of their life. They're, they're, the, the leading of God. 
their their own life. Everybody's got an orbit. Your your lifestyle, everything God's doing is an orbit around you. And this star is in their orbit. And this star is leading them. Folks, you go out and look at a starry night. And I will tell you, there are millions and millions of stars. I've never seen any of them move. That star had to be hanging right out in front of them. It's something I believe they were the only ones who could see. Folks, let's talk about that star. In your orbit, in your life, if you are hungry for Jesus, if you've got any desire for Jesus at all, and the reason the Lord starts with this far off, how far east, because he says he says to the uttermost, and that that's for the person who's sitting here tonight saying, well, I don't know, I am so far out. I'm so far from God, Pastor Dave, if you only knew my life, if you only knew the sin in my life, I'm too far gone. You may have a lot of wisdom of this world and you may, you may be, you've got life pretty well figured out, but there's an emptiness in you and there's been a drawing. I want to tell you, if you want to get to Jesus, the first thing you do is you get a Bible. You get into the Word, you just study it. I know a young man that was, was put in solitary confinement and they allowed him to have nothing but a Bible. He was a murderer, <clears throat> never once gave a thought of Jesus. He got in there, let it sit for two weeks and finally he decided to pick it up out of boredom started in the book of John, led by the Holy Ghost. And by the time he got through John, he got so excited, he kept reading and reading, he would not only saved, but filled with the Spirit of God in that prison hole. You see, the star in your life is that person that's ignited by Christ, who has in him the light of the gospel, the light of Jesus, who, who knows the scripture said, so let your light shine that men may see your good works. Who ask you, sir, if you're, or ma'am, if you're here tonight for the first time, somebody talked to you about this church, somebody told you where it's at, gave you an address, or somebody brought you. That's your star. You're being led to Jesus. You don't know it. But the Holy Ghost is after you. He's got you appointed. I, I, I would imagine almost everybody in this building can think of somebody. Somebody who lived the life. Maybe on your job. And that's why it's so important to live the life of Christ before your brothers and sisters and your family and your co-workers. Because they're watching you and you are appointed to be somebody's star to lead them to Jesus. That's why I said, let your light so shine so men see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So, a star out of Jacob, and who shall live when God does this? Who's going to be able to stand before that? They get to Jerusalem by the leading of this star, and they stop. Now, if the star was still there, why couldn't they, when they ask Herod, they, they, they go to the one place they think would know, they go to the leadership of the nation, they go to the government leaders and say, where is this child who has been born king of the Jews? Well, they already had a king. What a startling thing for somebody to say. Evidently, he'd sent him to the priest. But if the star was there, why didn't they just go out in the open and say, look up there, see the star, and tell them the whole story. They, they couldn't do it. The star was not there. Because it's very clear from the story that when they left, finally get out of Jerusalem, the star appeared again. You see, in, in the pursuit of Jesus, there are a lot of people who get very hungry for Christ. They, they, everything's become so empty. If you've had sickness, pain, if you've ever been in a home where there's cancer, 
We, we have a brother, uh, one of our uh, ushers in the hospital now with uh, brain hemorrhage. If you've ever been around life and death struggles, you begin to see the emptiness of life, the shortness of life. And you begin to reach out for reality. And there's some of you here right now in that position, I believe, with everything in me. And you begin to say, Jesus, where are you? And you start a pursuit for Christ. You start a pursuit for Jesus. And I'm just talking to you from my heart. I'm not talking from notes. I'm talking from my heart. And you're seeking Him. You, you see, I'm not looking for religion. I'm looking for Jesus. And you start on this path. You search for Christ to get close to Him. I will be closer to Jesus. I want reality in my life. And suddenly you get stuck in some denominational gibberish. You get stuck in some ritual in some church. And they talk about Jesus. These religious leaders knew where he was going to be born. They knew the town. They, 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 they had all the knowledge in their head. They could talk about the coming Messiah, but they didn't know him. They were the, the least knowledgeable. And it was right there. Those that were closest were the blindest. And you can, I, I think some of the blindest people to the reality of Christ, those who are most blind to His reality, are those who are full of religion. Not Christ, but religion. Well, bless God, I'm a Catholic. I'm a Lutheran. I'm an Episcopalian. You can be a Lutheran, you can be an Episcopalian, you can be a Pentecostal, and go to hell. Because you don't know Him. You got something in the head, but you don't have it in the heart. You really don't know him. You've never been his presence. You've never been to him. You don't know him. You've not seen him. And the Holy Ghost is your star tonight, and he's leading you. He's brought you here tonight to hear a very, very simple word. He wants to change your life. He wants you to kneel before him, look him in the face, and say, This is my Redeemer. This is what I've been looking for. Folks, you're not going to find Jesus till you get out of some religious uh, pitfall that you're in. Get away from addiction to some churchianity. I don't know what else to call it. <laughs> you get away from all of the... You've been born and raised in it. I, I hear people everywhere you go. Are, do you go to church? Well, I, I was born a Catholic. I don't know what that means, born a Catholic. I don't know what it is to mean, born Baptist. You're born nothing. Well, my grandma went to the Catholic church, and all I've known is Catholicism. All I've known is, the, is, is this religion I have. Jettison your religion. You can't get to Christ till you throw your religion away and come simply to the manger. I uh, shouldn't get so excited. <laughs> but now, in Christ Jesus, you who were at one time far off are brought nigh by the blood of Christ. Hallelujah. Can you imagine, Harrison, when you find him, you come back and tell me all about it, describe, give me his address so I can go and worship him. That's the same thing that's going on in Washington right now. Same kind of lying, same kind of deception, same thing. Carry a Bible to church Sunday morning, and then put your hand on, make an oath, and lie about it. Not just the president, but all through the way, all, all through Congress and everything else. Folks, we need to pray. We need to pray. God, help us. We need to pray. You say, are you a Democrat? Are you a Republican? 
I told you I'm a Christocrat. <laughs> you know, we need to have a Holy Ghost preacher run for president so some of us could vote for a president. <laughs> I, I, I'm not a candidate. <laughs> Oh, who do you vote for? As soon as they get away from the religious headquarters and the synagogues of Jerusalem, the star appears. You know, this, this, when you look at Matthew, I'm going to close in just a moment, back to Matthew, the second chapter, verse 9. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star, when they got out, lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Folks, look at me. The star brought them to where the child was. There's a tugging of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, it, it, I can't describe it another way. When... When the Holy Spirit is moving, that's the Holy Spirit tugging and pulling. There's a tug, there's a pull. <clears throat> I'm going to close with a simple illustration about that tug. Years ago, here in New York City, when I started Teen Challenge for drug addicts, in the first few years, one of the roughest, toughest females she was a gang leader, she was a drug addict, wild, like a wild animal, untamed wild animal. Brought her into our girls' program in Brooklyn, Cookie Rodriguez. And uh, Cookie was hard as nails. Nothing could reach her. And <clears throat> we were about to give up on her. And in fact, we had to make a decision the following week whether or not to even try any longer. We had tried everything. <clears throat> there was one staffer, a young lady, a godly young lady on her staff, who had taken a special interest in Cookie. And uh, <clears throat> I had to go to Pittsburgh to speak for Catherine Kuhlman uh, that weekend. And I said, well, and, and I invited, I got a couple vans, and we we're taking the whole group to Pittsburgh to be in my rally. And I said, make sure that Cookie's on board, make sure she comes. She said, I'm not going. I'm not going. She was going to leave, but you see, she had a star. There's somebody that she trusted, somebody that took special care, somebody that truly lived Christ. There was no phoniness or hypocrisy in the staffer, and all she had to do was put her arms, her arms around her and said, Cookie, I'll go with you. I'll stand with you. I'll sit with you. I'll go the whole trip. You are my guest. And Cookie said, I'll go. And Cookie came and sat in a balcony up on this side at our youth rally on a Saturday night in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, with Catherine, in Catherine Coleman's meeting. Sister Coleman was behind me, and I was preaching. And I didn't know anything about Cookie except she was the hardest one I think I could ever seen. And that young staffer was beside her. And believe me, she, she was a star. She was leading her. And it came, that star came and sat right over where Jesus was in that meeting. And Cookie sat there, her hands folded, chewing gum. And halfway through my message, the Spirit of God began to reveal Christ. And she had not shed a tear in her lifetime. She never, ever remembered shedding a tear. She never cried in her life, full of hate and bitterness. And I had been preaching about how God can do anything, break any barrier, if you want Jesus, he'll break through every barrier. And she grit her teeth and said, God, if you're real, if you really exist, if you love me like Pastor Dave is saying, you've got to make me cry. I want to cry. I've never, I don't know what it is to cry. And she sat there waiting and nothing happened for a while. And all of a sudden, when she just about discouraged, she felt a hot tear run down your cheek and then another and she grabbed her star and it just broke then it sobbed like a baby and she grabbed her star and said I'm crying I'm crying 
Well, she didn't know she hadn't cried. There's nothing unusual about that. Everybody was crying. She said, I'm crying. Don't you understand? I'm crying. He's real. God's real. Jesus loves me. Cookie Rodriguez founded New Life for Girls. It's a thriving program that saved hundreds of women from drugs and alcohol. And Cookie today is in the ministry, still going strong for God. Listen to me, please. Listen to me. The Holy Spirit's dealing with you in great love and compassion. This is the night for you to come to the full reality. Some of you say, Brother Dave, I've come so far, but I have not really gotten to Jesus the way I want to get to him. Something seems to block me. I go so far and I get stuck. Listen to me clearly. The last thing I want to say to you before I give an invitation, up in the balcony here in the main floor. The Holy Spirit is leading you now. He's going to tug at you. We're going to stand in just a moment. We're going to just sing an invitation. It's not mood music. It's the, just to give the Holy Ghost some time to tug and pull at your heart. Don't come unless the Spirit calls you. But if you have something in your heart saying, there's got to be more than I found. I want Jesus Christ in my life, not just my head. I want him in my heart. I want to experience Jesus. I want to be as close to him as these wise men were that knelt before him and were able to touch him. I want to touch my Jesus. I want you to stand, please. Up in the balcony, in here, in the main floor. Would you look this way for me? Beloved, please listen, just a moment, before this service is history. This is life and death for some of you now. This is life and death. I don't know if these wise men had hoped they could have made some kind of a covenant or an agreement so that lives would be spared. I don't know. We do know that the, the shepherds went away worshiping. We know these men worshiped. We don't know how deep the work was. We don't know anything about that. But I do know right now that they were able to fulfill their mission. They were led to Christ. You are being led by the Holy Ghost. And if you feel that tug, you feel that pull up in the balcony, go to the stairs on either side and come and stand here. Jesus said, the Bible said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father and all the angels of heaven. I want you to come and say, Pastor Dave, I have not found what I'm looking for. I want Jesus. I want a manifestation of him in my life and my heart. Let the Holy Ghost be your star and lead you now. Draw you and come to him. You, you have got to allow Jesus to fill every empty spot in your heart and to heal every wound in you at this Christmas season. There was a, a gentleman that came forward just like you did in this church. <clears throat> He's received Christ, but uh, allowed this season to get to him and some other problems in his life to get to him and a few days ago took his life I remember another young lady that came and stood at an altar here beautiful young lady a young model she said I want Jesus but she had a hard time allowing Christ and his word to become life to her and to have meaning to her. It can't just be a head thing. It has to be God. You come into my heart and your Holy Spirit just fill me up and drive out of me every thought. I've got to bring that all into captivity. I've got to allow the Holy Spirit to comfort me. I've got to allow him to come and drive out all those thoughts the enemy tries to infuse into my mind, inject into my mind. And she leaped out of an eighth floor building and took her life. 
I'm asking, I honestly believe, I'm saying this because I feel it's life and death for some of you here that are standing here right now. There been a lot of people brought to Jesus today in the last two services and again here tonight. And the Lord knows exactly what you're going through. There's nothing you, that, that's going on that God can't solve and make a way that you don't know anything about. He can make a way. Look at me now. You may have been trying to figure it out and figure it out now for days. You say, there's no way out, brother. If I'm in a mess. I've got trouble in my life. I'm confused. And I don't any, know any way out. My Bible says very clear that he knows the way out. A way that you can't even think about. He's a miracle working God. You've got to believe that and trust that now. Trust that. Say, Jesus, I'm going to commit my life to you. I'm going to give you my heart. Jesus, I'm going to draw nigh to you. And you said, if I draw nigh to you, you will draw nigh to me. You believe that and he'll keep his word, I promise you. He will keep his word. You came here to draw nigh to him now. You're being led to him by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit stirred your heart. You didn't walk down here just out of habit. You came down here now because the Spirit of the Lord is at work in you. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Will you pray this prayer with me? Now look at me, please. The prayer doesn't save you it's the word that comes out of the abundance of the heart words that come out of the abundance of the heart and he that's begun a good work in you will finish it the bible says he'll complete it until the day of the coming of the lord all he wants out of you is a sincere heart he'll even help you repent he'll even give you faith if you just start Amen. I've always pictured faith as standing on the mountain. The Lord showed me this when I was a kid, standing on the mountain. I was trying to figure out faith. And, and, and Lord, in this little thought, he said, just make a big snowball, big as you can, and pack it and push it, and start rolling it down the hill. And he said, after a while, it'll go momentum. It'll pick up itself and carry it on. And it gets bigger and bigger. You just start the little snowball. Give him snowball faith if you can. Just give him that little seed faith. And say, here, I give you, Lord, the best I have. I give you my confidence. I give you my faith. Pray this prayer with me, will you? Jesus, I don't know how to believe. I don't even know how to confess. I'm in a mess. I have trouble in my life. And I need a miracle. I'm coming to you, Jesus, like a little child. I'm asking you to forgive me and cleanse me. I give you my little seed faith and the best I know how I invite you into my heart not just my head but into my heart that I may serve you and that you would be the Lord in my life to rule and reign in my life Holy Spirit come and fill my vessel and help me to be obedient to everything you whisper in my heart I love you Jesus I come to you now I've obeyed you here I am Jesus take me as I am now will you thank him for doing just that give him thanks Lord I give you thanks I give you praise Lord you're good hallelujah blessed be the name of the Lord glory be to God Hallelujah. Amen. Lord, I pray for this congregation now. The balcony here in the main floor and behind me where the sound of my voice will be heard. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would become totally dependent on the Holy Ghost. We can't run our own lives. We just mess up. We sin and confess and sin and confess and we don't know what to do. So, Lord, we're just going to come now and surrender to you and become wholly dependent on the leading of the Holy Spirit. Lord, that's where I'm at. After all these years, I just say, Lord, hear my life. Whisper, Lord, speak. I'll, I'll obey you. I'll do whatever you tell me. You just have to speak to my heart. Lord, if we'll wait on you and believe you and spend time in prayer and in this word, you're going to lead us right. You'll not let us go astray. Glory be to God. I want you to turn around and shake hands with at least five or six around and say, God is good. God is good. God is faithful. God is good and God is faithful. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is the conclusion of the message.
This recording is provided by Times Square Church in New York City. You're welcome to make additional copies for free distribution to friends. All other unauthorized duplication or electronic transmission is a violation of copyright and other applicable laws. This recording cannot be posted on any website. However, written permission to link to the Times Square Church homepage may be requested by emailing info at timesquarechurch.org. Other recordings are available by calling 1-800-488-0854 or by writing to Times Square Church Tape Ministry, 1657 Broadway, New York, New York, 10019. Walking in the Spirit. Very simple word from the Lord. Walking in the Spirit. If you will, turn to Galatians, please, the fifth chapter. Fifth chapter of Galatians. I'm going to read three verses that have to do with my message. Galatians 5, verse 16, beginning to read. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Go to verse 18, please. But if you be led of the Spirit, I want to emphasize this word, led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Verse 25, if we live in the spirit, let us what? Also walk in the spirit. Now, Holy Spirit, we honor you this morning. We thank you for bringing Christ to us in such knowledge and wisdom and truth. Holy Spirit, that is what you have been called to do. And we acknowledge and we honor you. We pray now that you give us ears to hear. And I ask you, Lord, to give me a voice to speak. We know, Lord, that you're in this house, and we know that you want to speak to our hearts. We have hungry hearts. We hunger and thirst after truth. And, Lord, we give you, we give you all that we are and all that we have. We ask you, Lord, to make this truth a reality in our lives. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. In plain words, Simply this, if the Holy Spirit is in you, let him have control. Obey him. It's that simple. If he lives in you, then take orders from him. Walk in his ways. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to be a constant, ever-present guide and teacher in our lives. Now, you've heard that in You know that in theory, but many have believed this concept of walking in the Spirit is such a theological quagmire they can't understand it, and you have to be uh, in theology to define it. And I can take you to my library, and I can show you books written by theologians, three and four hundred pages thick, and I've waded through some of them, and I still couldn't understand what it means to walk in the Spirit. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to have a theological background to understand what it means to walk in the Spirit. If I ask you personally, if I could come to you and say, what, what do you believe it is? What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Could you explain it to me? Could you explain it to anyone who came to you and ask you to explain Galatians, the fifth chapter? Do you have a theory even? Do you have something that you practice, something that you know works in your life. What I'm preaching you this morning is not theology. I didn't get it from a book. I got it through experience and walking in tests and trials, and that's how it comes. Most of us have no trouble believing the Holy Spirit has been brought to us by Christ or given to us by Christ. We have no problem uh, talking about his gifts. We have no problem talking about praying in the Spirit. We have, no talk, we have no problem talking about the gifts and the fruits of the Spirit. We have no problem praying to the Holy Spirit. We have no problem with experiencing manifestations and believing manifestations of the Spirit. But so few of us know the walk of the Spirit. You see, you can be filled with the Spirit. And it's another thing to walk in the Spirit. And that's what I want to deal with this morning, the Lord helping us. 
We are missing, I think, in the church of Jesus Christ, the one truth, the one great truth that can bring rest to our soul. It's a truth that I believe can take away the distress and bring peace to the heart. And yet we have missed this. We we have talked so much, especially in charismatic circles, about the power, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. But there's almost little or no understanding of what it means to be under the government of the Holy Spirit. That he, he has come to guide us in all truth. He's come to direct our lives. He's come to take full control of everything we say and everything we do. Your walk, for example, my walk has everything to do with me, who I am and what I do and what I say and how I act. It's my lifestyle. And it's not enough for me to be able to speak with tongues and say, that is the Holy Ghost. It's not enough for me to even pray in the Spirit. It's not enough for me to talk to you about the gifts or or uh, show forth the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I have to have an understanding. I have to know how every day in my life there's such confusion. There are so many decisions to be made. And I can't do it myself. I can't figure things out. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to take his place. He is in glory, a glorified man. He said, I can't walk with you now. I walk my season in this earth and I fellowship with my servants and my apostles and the, the multitudes. But now I'm going to glory. He said, and I'm going to give you my spirit because you see the Holy Spirit. The Bible said the spirit is the Lord. It's the spirit of Christ himself. I preach the triune Godhead. I believe in a trinity. But the very spirit that is in us now is the very mind of Christ. It is the very essence that is in Christ. The very essence of God himself. We have abiding in us. There are only two ways to walk. You walk either in the flesh... That means deciding your own way, making your own decisions, or walking in the Spirit. And walking in the Spirit means that you make no move, you go nowhere, you you don't do anything until you consult with the Holy Spirit and you get His mind. That He is in full control, that I have no will of my own. I've surrendered my will to the Holy Spirit. Because He knows the mind of God and He is the mind of Christ. And I surrender my will. I have no more will. I give it to him. Jesus walked in complete submission to his heavenly father. And here it is in his own words. The son of man can do nothing of himself. But what he sees the father do. For what things soever he doeth, so does the son likewise. Jesus said, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, then I judge, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Jesus said, for I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And I live by the Father. And in John 4, 17, we hear these words. As he is in the world, so are we. Who do we think we are that we can do what Jesus could not do? Who are we to think that we can make our own decisions, go our own way? And we can do what we think is right. We can do even what we think is good. And we consult with people. We can get on the phone and we can ask, is this good? We can check with our pastors. We check with our family. We check with everyone and last and probably least, sometimes not at all, consulting with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I do nothing. I don't say anything. I wait on the Father. I have no will of my own. I'm here to do only the will of my Father. And as He is in the world, so are we. As a believer and a lover of Jesus Christ... I can't conceive that I have that kind of power. I can do what Christ himself chose not to do. Surely he was wisdom. 
Surely he was knowledge. He was all of these things. But he waited on the Father to see what was the mind of God. Then and then only did he act and move. In the, chap- in the ninth chapter of Numbers, we, we see a very vivid picture of what it means to be under the government of the Holy Spirit. There was a cloud that appeared when Israel left Egypt. The cloud by day and a warm glow at night, a fire by night. And it hung and hovered over the people and began to lead them into the wilderness. And then when the tabernacle was built, that cloud descended from heaven and, and stood and, and hovered over the Holy of Holies, the tabernacle that was built in the wilderness for the Israelites. And that cloud hovered there. And they did not move until that cloud moved. By day, it was a cloud, a visible cloud, representing, I believe, the Holy Spirit and the very essence and presence of Christ revealed through the Holy Spirit. The scripture says, so it was always the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. When the cloud lifted up from the tabernacle, the children of Israel moved on. When the cloud stopped, they stopped. They pitched tent. Then at the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. And at the commandment or the word of the Lord, they pitched their tents. As long as the cloud abode on the tabernacle, they rested in their tents. And when the cloud rested many days, the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and did not move. If the cloud rested for just a few days, the scripture said they stayed in their tents according to the Lord's commandment. Then moved as the cloud moved. If the cloud moved even in the morning, they moved. If it moved at night, they moved. Whether it was two days or a month or a year, they moved not until the cloud moved. Not one move, not one step out of the camp. They waited for the cloud to move. The cloud would lift when it was time to go. If the cloud stayed two days, it would descend over the tabernacle. When it was time to go, the cloud would lift and begin to drift away. And they were told, they were taught, go, follow the cloud. Now, Israel sinned in the wilderness. They committed adultery, fornication, idolatry. But one thing that they were obedient in, they never, ever moved without the cloud, except on one occasion. And I'll tell you that in just a moment. And it led to disaster. At the commandment, the word of the Lord, they rested. And at his word, they moved on. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have a cloud. That cloud was lifted from Israel because of idolatry and sin in its final days. And that cloud was lifted to glory. But on the day of Pentecost in the city of Jerusalem, that cloud descended over 120 people. And that cloud came down and stood over that upper room, hovered over the upper room. And then it slowly descended more and came into the building. And when that cloud came into the building, it shook. And that cloud... That spirit of the living God descended further. And that cloud of fire began to break up. It began to split, cloven, tongues of fire. You see, it was a fire by night, and this is the darkest time in Israel. In that dark hour, just before the light is coming, the Spirit of God descends not only above the building, but in the building, and finally on their heads and shoulders. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. The Bible said, cloven tongues of the fire sat upon each of them. And that word, cloven in Greek, means thoroughly distributed. Thoroughly distributed. That fire began to spread. And not only did that cloud sit upon them, 
It entered their very bodies, and those bodies became the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Bible said they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. And now they are filled with the Holy Ghost. I ask you, are you filled with the Holy Ghost? Do you, would you answer me? Do you believe the Holy Ghost abides in you? He came. We, we, we keep praying, oh, Holy Ghost, come down. Well, he's here. He has come down. But he wants to take full control of these vessels. This is his tabernacle. This is his temple. You see, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. But the Bible said if we live in the Spirit, in other words, if, if the Spirit is in you and, and the Spirit lives in you and you live in the Spirit, then walk in him. Now, I've asked the Lord to open up this scripture to me, this this matter of walking in the Spirit. And I've been praying and seeking God. Lord, I want to understand this simply. I want you to make it simple so the child can understand. Because that's the only way I can come with this. Because I, I, want, to, I, I want to live it. I want to walk in the Spirit. I've been preaching about the Holy Ghost for years and years. Pentecostal background. My father and grandfather. Lord, make it simple. And the Holy Spirit, in prayer, said, the truth is, David, that, and it's, this is that still small voice of the Spirit. I don't hear audible voices, but that still small inner voice. And this is what I heard, that it's so simple, most of us miss it. And most great truths in the Bible are missed because of their simplicity. We, we so complicated. We look for so many hidden meanings and, 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 and come at it with so many different theological ways that we miss the simple truth. And I just waited on the Holy Spirit. And finally, three little words came to me. And the Lord said, I'm giving you the golden key to understand this. And if you'll take this to heart, you can live and walk in the Spirit. And, and you can share it with others. And when I heard... <coughs> Three little words. I said, Lord, that is too simple. So simple, I don't understand it. Three little words to understand walking in the Spirit. Just say yes. And I I said, Lord, I don't understand that. Just say yes. Show me. Scripture, I was led to 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all the promises of God are him, yes and amen, to the glory of God by us. It's not yes or no, it's not maybe, all the promises of God are yes and amen. And it came down to this, and when I began to see it, I clenched my fist and yet, yes! He, I began to go over every the promises, the great promises that he gave me. And let me go over some of these promises, the Holy Spirit, that Jesus gave us. And see if you can say yes. And see if you can read it. Clench your fist in joy. And against the devil. And say yes, because it's yes and amen. Amen and so be it. In other words, I believe it. In fact, amen means trustworthy, and so be it. I can trust what Jesus said. First thing he said, and I want you to listen closely, he said, I have established you, I've anointed you, I've sealed you with the Holy Spirit, I have filled you with the Holy Spirit. Do you say, yes! You can't walk in the Spirit until you believe that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. He doesn't flirt or flit in and out of our lives every time we're in trouble, every time we do something wrong. He's still there. I need him more when I do wrong than when I'm going right. Secondly, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, 
that he will abide with you forever and he will lead you into all truth. He will take that which can be known of Christ and he will show it to you. He will guide you. He will lead you. And he'll bring you into the truth of Christ. Can you say yes? yes. You know I never try to work a crowd. I usually say, don't say anything. Don't clap. But I'm so excited on these simple words of walking in the Spirit. There has, there has to come a divine yes. Intractable, positive, definite, no possibility of maybe or no. Yes! I ran around my room, my fist clenched. Yes, every promise in the book is mine. When I was a, a boy in my dad's church, they had a song they sang almost every week. Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. And the promise of his love divine. Every promise in the book is mine. In the early church in my boyhood time, believed that and lived it. And we do it again today. Jesus promised that there would be an inner voice, a guide, a teacher. He would glorify Christ in you. He would show you things to come. He will show you something about where you to go and how you're to go. Can you say yes to being guided by the Holy Spirit? And here's a promise. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. He, who? The Holy Ghost. He will direct your path. He will direct your steps. When I was praying about this, I said, but Lord, what about the safeguards? Because I, 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 I'm about to order a book. It's a theological discourse or lecture about... Uh, all the dangers of listening to inner voices. You see, the flesh has a voice. The devil has a voice. And the world has a voice. How do I know it's the Holy Ghost? How do I know it's the Holy Spirit? Now, there are many of you listening to me now, and many in the ministry, who can't accept this walk of having a constant, uninterrupted voice of the Holy Spirit directing your life. Because you have tr tried to trust that voice or tried to hear the voice of the Lord and somewhere, sometime you made a mistake or you say it didn't happen. I thought I heard the Holy Ghost, but it was not the Holy Spirit. Now, there are safeguards. God would never allow his people who seek to be led by the Holy Spirit and walk in the Holy Spirit as directed by the word and then let them be deceived. Impossible. Not when you're on your face, not when you're seeking him, not when you're asking for the cleansing and not when you believe that the Holy Ghost mortifies the deeds of the flesh. Only the Holy Spirit. You cannot mortify your sin. There's no other way but faith in the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. If you mortify the deeds of the flesh through the spirit, you shall live, the scripture says. Now, let me talk about the safeguards. Ephesians 6.16 what about, you see, you see, if you, if you're going to have the safeguards, it requires another divine yes. It has to be an intractable divine yes. Uh, 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 I will believe. If I'm going to walk this kind of walk, I'm going to believe that the Holy Spirit will keep His word. I'll take these other promises. He has promised to protect us. These are protective promises so that we know the voice. Jesus said, you, the world doesn't know the Holy Spirit, but you know him. You know him. You know him by familiarity, by spending time with him, by trusting in him. But let me give you the safeguards, please. Take the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the shield of faith that you may be able to quench 
The devil's voice, every word that comes from his mouth, everything he tries to, in, in, to, to inject into the, to the mind, these are fiery darts of Satan. And there is only one protection, and that is to believe what God said. If you will believe me, if you will take this step of faith, and you will consult me, if you will walk in the Spirit, in other words, trust Him, that when you seek Him, and when you believe that He abides in you, and that He has a voice, that He will speak, and He will lead and guide and keep you from evil, He will keep you from disaster, He will keep you from these terrible mistakes that we make in life. He said... Will you believe that I have a shield? I am your shield and I will protect you. I will keep it and trust that he knows how to do it. There's no preacher anywhere can explain how he puts up the shield. My part is to believe that he has promised to be a shield to me. And I go to prayer waiting on the Holy Spirit and praying, Holy Spirit, you shield me from any voice of the enemy. You shield me from the voice of the flesh. There's another scripture. For... The flesh lusts or fights against the spirit. And we're talking about now discerning the Holy Spirit from the spirit, the voice of the flesh. And here's the promise. The flesh lusts or fights against the spirit. And the spirit fights against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another. And now you have the voice of the flesh and you have the Holy Spirit in my heart. There, there, in this body of mind, there are two voices that are clam the, the, the voice of flesh always clamoring for attention and always trying to tell me what to do. Always tell me it's right. Always tell me go to get some counselors to agree with my way and then go to God and pray and God has to bless it. Do it my way and then go to prayer and ask God to just bless what I have. I hear people say, well, God's given us a sound mind. We have an intelligent mind and, and God helps those who help themselves. And, and I'm just going to use my intelligent spiritual mind. Well, then you're acting on your own will, I believe. Yes, he does. Now, I'm not I'm not saying you go to your closet and say, Holy Spirit, what dress do I wear or what color suit do I put on today? I'm not asking you to go to the Holy Ghost and ask him what cereal you pick for breakfast. I'm asking you for all of these all of these things that have to do with walking, walking, those decisions in life that are so important that we never act. You don't have to go into a closet. You can, you can do it sometimes in just a few moments. You stop. You see, the Holy Ghost is never in a hurry. He's never in a rush. He said, be still and know that I'm God. And you just wait for a moment. If you stop, I don't care where it's at and what the issue may be. Holy Spirit, you abide in me. What is your mind? What is your word? He'll never fail. Now, here's the voice of the flesh. And here's the Holy Spirit in this vessel of mine. Who do you think is going to win this war? The flesh or the Holy Ghost? Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. This is not your war. It's not mine. I go to the Holy Spirit and I claim this promise. I claim this, that you're at war. It's not my war. You're, you're the one who's contrary to my flesh. I don't know how to distinguish the flesh at all times, but you know what is flesh. Holy Spirit, I believe you to quench the flesh. I believe you to break through every barrier of the flesh and give me your mind. Never once will God fail. Ephesians 14, 4, 30, verse 30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. And that word grieve, sadden. Don't sadden the heart of God by neglecting the ministry of the Holy Spirit for which he's been sent. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness because of their unbelief? Israel's most grievous act of unbelief is found in the first chapter of Deuteronomy. It was a time 
that the cloud was about to move across into Canaan and then the cloud would be lifted. And they were told they stand there on the side of the river. And the Lord says, now it's time to act. It's time to go on. Go in. I've made you the promises. You go now. Go into the into Canaan. This is where the cloud was moving. And they said no, and they rebelled against him. The Bible makes it very, very clear. Moses said, you did not believe God's word. Not one of you shall see the good land. You will die in your despair. God was grieved. Now, God never left them. Even though they were not going to obey God at this time, God was faithful. He saw them through the wilderness. God doesn't drop his people for even an unbelief. God still, they, we don't believe, the Bible said he remains faithful. He still loved his people, though they're in belief. But you see, they missed the blessing. They, they missed the life that God had planned for them with rest, divine rest. The Bible in, in Hebrews said they missed the rest that was promised. Because they did not move with God. They didn't go with God. They didn't obey his word. They didn't go with his direction. And then they gird themselves, the Bible said. They said, well, because now they were told God's not going to go with you. you you're choosing your own way. And so they said, the Bible says they girded themselves. They put on their weapons. They had no direction. The cloud didn't go with them. And yet they went up the hill to battle against the enemy. They said, we're going to go in. They go up the hill. And the Bible... Moses told him, he said, you're going to be chased as bees are chased, as bees chase you. In other words, you're going to hit a bee's nest because you're going your own way, making your own decisions. God's not with that. And the Bible says they were chased as with bees. Now, folks, I look back over my life and the times that I acted without consulting the Holy Spirit. Not just to get permission, but say, Lord, is this your will? Is this what you want? And when I've acted on my own volition, and when I've taken my own will at hand and did what I thought was just right, and thought I was smart enough and intelligent enough to know what was right and wrong, and I've acted that way, I've every time looked back over my life, as many of these issues that I can remember, of all these times I've acted in my past 50 years of ministry, I've always run into that bee's nest. I've always been chased by distress. I've always found it just like sand sieving through my fingers. But when I've obeyed the Holy Spirit, He's always blessed. And He's always been there. Years ago, some over 40 years ago, the little town of Pennsylvania, the Holy Spirit spoke to me clearly. Go to New York City and work with gangs and drug addicts. And it was a clear voice. Now, you just don't pick up when you're in a little town of 1,500 people up in the hills of Pennsylvania. You just don't get up and go unless you know God sent you. And then you don't go tell your wife you're going to move to New York when you have a nice little cottage with a picket fence and nobody around to bother you. No neighbors. You see, you have to hear from God. And I heard from the Lord. He said, go to New York and work with drug addicts. And I moved with the cloud. The cloud was moving. I, I moved with that cloud. I said, yes, Lord. And I look back over those years, and now over 500 Teen Challenge Centers around the world, 500, thousands and thousands of drug addicts being saved. I'm not boasting, but in the faithfulness of God. But, you see, I had been on my face for weeks and weeks, praying that God would speak because... Often when God's trying to lead us, he'll stir the nest and we have that divine restlessness and we know God's trying to get our attention. 
And I look back over my past life. And I came to New York City and four or five years later, after coming, obeying the Holy Spirit, the Lord spoke clearly to my heart. Write a book. And we called it The Cross and Switchblade. And that book went all over the world. And it's opened doors so that now in my latter years, I can go anywhere in the world. And that book God used to open up the doors. Because you see, the cloud moved and the cloud said, do this. And I did it. I obeyed him. Now, folks, there were a lot of times I didn't. And in between all of these blessings I'm talking about, there there were times of, of loving, chastening from the Lord because I ran off and did my own thing and it blew up in my face. I could write a whole book on just that. It'd be bigger than the cross and Swiss blade. Eleven years ago, I was driving down the interstate in Pennsylvania, one of the interstates. And I, I had some tapes that had been in the car for months. And I picked up this tape and I put it in the tape player on the radio in the car. It was Pastor Conlon. And uh, Holy Spirit said, put another one in. In the second tape, I heard a voice. And the Holy Spirit said, pull off the robe. I said, why? He said, there's a telephone number there. Call him and invite him to preach. So I got on the phone. I got Sister Teresa. And I, I don't remember all the details, but here he is. <laughs> Still, small voice. Of the Holy Spirit. I believe this. I believe with all my heart. And I have made an irretractable, absolute, positive yes to every promise in the book. And to believe that what Jesus promised me is true. That this Holy Spirit in me will guide me. He will lead me into all truth. And show me things to come. He'll show me the road. This life is possible. The last one I want to talk about. Just five years ago, the Lord said, in your last days, and uh, I don't have any premonition of an early death. I can't die an early death. I'm already past the... Uh, I'm four years to the good beyond the promise of 70. I know I don't look it, but I am 74. <laughs> that was flesh. <laughs> But the Lord said, I want you to share your time with pastors and I want you to go to the nations. And we've been doing it for the last four years and the Lord's been faithful. I want you to stand. And this is not flesh. I want you to do something finally. And I'm not. I promise the Lord not try to whip you up. Are you tired of making such terrible decisions that just mess up? And are you ready now to say, I hear something from the Holy Spirit? If he abides, if he lives in me and I live in the spirit, then I want to walk in the spirit. I want to surrender my will. And I'm saying, Holy Spirit, govern my life. Govern my life. 
You and I are under the government of the Holy Spirit. And that's how Jesus intended it. To bring us into the relationship with Christ that the Father so desires for us. Are you willing to give one irretractable? In other words, you can't take it back. You say, Lord, the best I know in my heart, I mean it. I want to say a great, powerful, yes. Let me hear it. Yes. Yes, Lord. Father, thank you for the Holy Ghost. Jesus, thank you for the Holy Spirit. Lord, we want to be a church that walks in the Spirit. That we hear from God. That we hear that still small voice saying, yes. Follow me. My promises are for you. Let it be. So let it be. Yes and amen. Not nay and yea, not yes and no, not maybe, but yes, every promise is mine, so be it. Glory to God. If the Holy Spirit speaking to you and you have to confess unbelief and fear, if you don't know Christ, if you've never given your heart to Jesus, I invite you to step out of your seat and come and receive him as Lord and Savior and to... You, you can't be saved without the Holy Spirit drawing you. It's the Holy Spirit that comes to draw you to Christ. And I, we've been lifting up the Holy Spirit as we've been directed by the Word. We're to honor the Holy Spirit and we're honoring the Holy Spirit. And as we honor Him, He does His work. That means He's come to you and, and pricked your conscience or He has quickened your spirit. And He wants you to yield to Him. If you've backslidden, if you've, you've grown cold to the Lord, join these that are coming. And if you're here, we have never, ever... None of the pastors ever try to pack these altars or just have people standing, you know, filling it, all the aisles and everything, just for show. God forbid. But if you are drawn by the Spirit this morning, and you have been living in doubt and fear and unbelief, and you've been going your own way, and you say, Lord, I want to make a stand. And if you feel that of the Holy Spirit to come, you follow these that are coming. And in the annex, you just go stand between the screens, and I'll be praying for you in just a moment. And let's believe the Lord that when you walk out of here, you, you walk out of here with a confidence. You walk out here with a confidence. Bring your sins to Christ. Bring your unbelief. Bring your doubt. Bring your fear. We'll pray with you in just a moment. We invite you to step out. And and take your stand. Holy Spirit, we have shared with this congregation what we believe is your heart for this hour. And we pray now, Holy Spirit, you will come down and make this real to us, make it a reality. And for these that have stepped out, Lord, only you know what the battle is or what the struggle is or what the need is. And I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to meet that need. I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, now to open their eyes and their hearts. And Holy Spirit, draw them now into the love of Christ. Draw them by your power now, Jesus, to, to bring rest to their weary heart and mind. Only you can do that. I can't. But come now, Holy Spirit. We honor your abiding presence. Thank you for your drawing, Spirit, how you draw us. And you're drawing us to a deeper walk, a closer walk. Do that now, I pray. And I want you to pray this prayer with me now. Lord Jesus, thank you for sending the Holy Spirit. And now, Holy Spirit, I believe that you live in me and my body is your temple and that you're in the temple and that you do speak and I can trust you to make your voice known and to clear the path so that we know that I know that I've taken time to be with you and to listen to you and hear that still small voice that says this is the way walk in it now let me pray for you again Heavenly Father I'm asking for those that have backslidden that you bring them back to a knowledge of your love, that you still love them and that you want to make this the first day of a new beginning. And those, O Lord, who are struggling with a sin that has controlled their life and they've cried and they've wept and they don't know how to get free, let them understand that that's the work of the Holy Spirit. If they will trust, the Lord will come 
and he will mortify. That means he will, he will put underfoot, he will conquer every evil deed of the flesh. We trust in that covenant promise. Now, Lord Jesus, for those.